Welcome to another in between episode. As we continue to celebrate Nexus PMG's 7 year anniversary, today I have the great pleasure of interviewing Paul Hammond, one of our founders. Listen to Paul share his story of Nexus PMG's early beginnings all the way to where we are today. And now, on to the show. Welcome to another special in between episode. I'm your host Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Paul Hammond to the show. Paul is the Chief Financial Officer and a principal at Nexus PMG. He is responsible for financial strategy, governance, and compliance. Paul is dedicated to delivering world-class services for our clients in the lending and investing communities and owner developing teams. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks, Raj. Happy to be here. And how are you doing today, Paul? Very well. Um, good day here. Just uh, working from home, so excuse any crying babies and barking dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Paul, as you know, I like to open my show by asking my guests the following question: If you were asked to share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? Yeah, good question. Um, so. In a previous uh, previous life, I was working in a large EPC, took on a couple of expat assignments, and um, for those that worked in that kind of environment before, you usually get a rotation as, as a home leave or as part of a vacation package. And um, that package started off at twelve weeks on, two weeks off, and that merged into eight weeks on and two weeks off. And in those two weeks, I I know, traveled the world a lot. It's uh, actually how I met the other founders of Nexus PMG. Um, we would travel all around the world. And, and I guess the interesting fact about me is I've been to six of the seven continents and I've just got Antarctica left, left to go. So um, that's, my, that's my one personal goal. One of my personal goals is to head to Antarctica at some point. <laughs> well, hopefully this COVID will clear up soon and you can head down there. Yeah, I've put a, I've put a bit of a um, damper on my travel plans, but uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Longer term plan. <laughs> There you go. So, Paul, something special here. You know, take us back seven years ago. Paint us a picture. Where are you? What are you doing professionally? And how does Nexus PMG come to be? Yeah, I'm in uh, Ras Azor in the east coast of Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm living in a man camp on a in a newly constructed mineral city um, to support the modern aluminum uh, refinery program. Um, I was. That's, like I said, it's it's where I met the other founders of Nexus PMG, and we were working on the project for Fleur. Um, we had been on the project for almost three years, um, and we were in July. We were we had formed Nexus PMG. Uh, ben and I were getting ready to leave Saudi and, and head back home, and, and Roshan was just about leaving and getting ready to kind of migrate into our new offices and. Uh, and start work. Um, so that's that's July 13, and uh, over that time, I mean, we we didn't really have much of a plan in terms of what we wanted to do. We just want, knew we wanted to start Nexus and uh, and figure out from there, basically. And um, we, in our spare time, we were planning our first steps as a company. So we didn't have a lot of spare time. We were working uh, 72 hour weeks. Um, so on a one day a week, we would take some time, figure out what we wanted to do as Nexus, get all the early stuff together, all of the, uh, all of the early planning steps, um, figuring out <laughs> where we would be based, which is a, a task on its own, and, and some of the early nightmares, and uh, just, uh, just taking those early steps nice and slow and, and making a plan. So that early planning, the, that once a week, I can imagine you guys around a table kind of discussing, what did you envision for Nexus? Yeah, it's a good question. We, um, I think we envisioned a plan for ourselves more than a plan for Nexus. We wanted to be in control of our own destiny. We were, as, as anybody who's worked for the large Fortune 500 companies knows, you're, you're part of a corporate system. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to sound overly egotistical, but we were entrepreneurial by nature, fairly high achievers, um, and then the three of us just didn't really feel like we we fit on a corporate structure. So. As that and that corporate structure is kind of structured five years in one position, promotion, five years in the next promotion, and you know how it is. And uh, we just we just felt that was a better model for, for the three of us. And that was kind of a, one of the 
one of the factors that brought us together um, was that frustration of that system and, and thinking we could do something differently, something merit-based and kind of do things better. Um, so there was the in control of our own destiny part. And there was also the, the side of it where we just wanted to do things better uh, than other people. Um, it's kind of a driving factor be between the three of us as well, I believe. We, we just like to improve things and fix things and make things better. And um, we, we had, again, we had that high opinion of ourselves and our abilities, which, which I think any entrepreneur has to have. Um, and we thought we could go sell a premium service to groups to align with our, our mindset and our values, um, which included putting quality above everything else. So that was kind of the, the vision we had for ourselves and what we could do now. The vision for the company was selling services, basically, and that's, that's how the company started out. We were project controls, accounting, finance professionals, um, and we, we went down that road of, hey, we can, we can build a market here and go and sell those services individually, and, and there's a company to, to the groups like the, like the large EPCs of the world, um, which then transitioned into working with lenders, working with investors, working with developers, and um, the skill sets kind of stayed the same, and the, and the clients were the ones that, that got a little bit more varied, but the, the overall work and the overall approach has, has stayed fairly consistent throughout. So as you were putting the reins on your own destiny there and working your way through these years, what are some of the valuable lessons you'd say you've learned along the way? Oh, there are, there are so many. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote one of my favorite authors here is a, is a guy called Raj Daniels. You may have heard of him. Um, <laughs> he's got a pretty good book. And uh, in that book, he, he relates a lot of lessons to return on investment and self-care. Um, so the, the number one lesson I've got and I've learned throughout the, the well, throughout my whole career, in fact, is um, safety is your number one priority on any project, any industry, anything we do. Um, and I think learning that at the professional level transcribes through into your, into your personal life as well. Um, I feel like that's, it's a good way to value the, uh, to, to see value in your loved ones and, and everything, every process and make sure things are running running smoothly and safely. Um, and then the other side of that is prioritize your health. So um, sleep, diet, exercise. I, I firmly believe that'll benefit you more than 16 hour days at the office. Um, and on the rare occasion that they do come up, then you're in, you'll probably be in a better shape to, to tackle those than you would if you were regularly doing that and ignoring some of the, the warning signs that I've seen people ignore in the past. And um, really just focusing on you helps Help will help the bigger team as well. So they're, they're two of the main ones. Um, that kind of fits in with uh, some of the some of the books I read and uh, Ray Dalio's principles is a big guiding. Uh, it helps me kind of a lot in how I approach lessons learned and how I approach looking after myself and business. And I think that's a, a, an interesting uh, a book to derive principles from basically on how you want to operate, how you want to be, who you want to be. Um, how you want to do business, and, and that's been a, a big influence. That actually, I see the, the kind of um, similarities between your book and, and Ray's, and it. they've both been really influential in how I in how I manage myself. Um, there are a, a number of different lessons I, I could go on all day on this, but um, you read the contract would be a personal one of mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that to everybody. The first thing anybody asks on any project or or, or anything. Should be where to contract and what documents I need to read. Um, I've learned the hard way on a lot of these. Um, it's okay to say I don't know, but I'll find out. That's, um, that's, there's two lessons in there. It's kind of humility to, to know what your weaknesses are and, and kind of be open enough to um, admit to what you don't know, but have the, um, have the integrity to follow up and, and make sure that you've closed any, any gaps there. Um, Taking emotions out of decisions is a big one as well. Uh, sent, a, sent a fair few emails in my time that probably shouldn't have been sent. <laughs> so sleep on something, make a decision the next day when you when you take an emotion out of it. Again, that's that's one of the um, that's a piece of advice from a book called Why We Sleep as well. Uh, that's a, another really good book, and that kind of fits in with the initial prioritize your health, um, prioritizing sleep. It's a it's a huge influence on on how I live my life. Um, one of my other ones, it's, and this is more personal to me, 
ha have a day where you where you truly leave everything on the field. So um, I mentioned the sixteen hour days before. I, I think there's going to be a point where any any professional or any entrepreneur has to work those, and you're going to have to get to a point where one day you're gonna you're gonna work sixteen eighteen hours a day, and and you're gonna need to know you're gonna need that that day where that happens um, just to be successful. And I, hopefully they're few and far between. Um, but they, they do come up. Um, but for me, that those were the kind of the early days of my career working and trying to establish a, a, a position. Um, and that kind of let me know what my ceiling was and let me know what my limitations are. And I, I, I do reflect on those days fairly often um, in terms of what I can do, what I, what I can't do, and, and what I need to farm out. And it's really helped me be efficient in terms of how I operate. Um, and then probably I, I'll just say one thing that I, I didn't prioritize early in my career. It's, I wouldn't say it's a regret now, but it's something that I could have definitely improved on. And I think if you build two networks, one, one of things that you're passionate about and your hobbies, and then the other things that you're good at, um, then you can kind of align the two. Um, and then you'll get to a point where, where you meet people to share your vision and where you, where you may get to a point where you get an opportunity to do something that you love and something that you're good at, which is um, fortunately for me, kind of kind of where I've landed uh, with Nexus BMG. So that's a that's a huge one for me. It's been a it's been a learning curve. It's been um, something I'm not particularly comfortable doing. I think that's that's a good point as well to go outside of your comfort zone and push yourself. But um, that's that's been a, a, a huge influence on my career as well. The, the networking side. So, Paul, I really appreciate you sharing those lessons. You know, Nexus PMG, you, Ben, and Roshan were about five years into your journey. Let's call it 2018, early 2019. And the company made a pretty hard right turn, you know, a strong pivot to decide to go down the road of only taking projects that were in the low carbon or zero carbon sector. How did that come up? What was that conversation like? And then what pushed you guys over the edge to make that commitment? Yeah, we, we hired exceptionally well um, up to that point. And from, I would say, 20, early 2014 through to late 2017, early 2018, the, the partners were really um, focused on execution. We were, we were ourselves um, out executing work and, and making sure the business was thriving and succeeding, well, growing and succeeding, um, and, and, and really focusing on, on delivering a, a great product. And then we, we hired really well. We brought in some incredible talent um, in 2017, 2018, hired in a couple new partners that, that really changed the way we do business, hired in a couple management level employees that really um, hired well as well at the operational level um, and, and gave us an opportunity as, as partners in the company to um, step back and, and drive strategy rather than the previously regular fire drills and execution that we um, that we previously been focused on. So, I think at that point we we sat back and we identified our shared values and and things we were passionate about as a as a as a group, um, and we identified long term markets that could sustain Nexus for PMG for no that could sustain Nexus PMG for 50, 50 years. Let's say I mean that was our long term vision was. How can we make this a 50-year company? And we, we hadn't really asked ourselves that question previously. We've been so focused on um, just doing a good job that now we had 30, 40 people we were responsible for, their livelihoods. We, we kind of stepped back and said, well, hey, how can, we, how can we make sure these guys have long, successful careers with Nexus PMG? And um, the point where those, those two focuses of shared values and things we were passionate about kind of came together and... Um, building a better world was sounds corny, but that was really something we were all passionate about. And it's it's a high level goal, it's a high level strategy, and I think that's what's benefited us is that it's open to interpretation from so many different people. So I want to build a better world. What does that mean? And if you ask ten different people, you're going to get ten wildly different answers. And, um, I think that's that's been one of the drivers of us adopting that as a core value that. Um, we it's so open that we can we can pivot and say hey we, we we really think that's a great idea and we can be flexible and respond to that as a as a goal for the business now we like I said when we started a company we wanted to do things better and continually improve and I think that um, that, that focus has carried through in building a better world so what did that mean to to the partners that made that decision to be a core value well that meant um, improving the world. Um, 
in terms of climate change, in terms of uh, triple bottom line focused projects, and how can we leave the the world in a better place for our loved ones than than what we than what we've inherited? And um, so that focus was really okay. Well, how can we transcribe that into a business model? And so we came to the conclusion that the um, the projects we took on would would have those triple bottom line gains. They'd be environmentally, socially, and financially profitable for any project stakeholders. And um, I feel it's a, a pretty decent goal to have. Um, there's there's way more we can expand on in terms of building a better world. But those that's really the high level goal of um, being a part of projects that really improve the world for for the stakeholders that are involved in those projects. So speaking of stakeholders, I want to congratulate you for your recent announcement, Baby Daughter, about a month ago. Thank you. How has that changed your idea? You know, you mentioned 10 different people building a better world. If I asked you, hey, Paul, what does it look like for you to build a better world? What are some of your personal values? You mentioned shared values earlier. What are some of your personal values around that? Yeah, I mean, she's six weeks old now. Um, so I haven't had a great deal of time to think about what that means to, to my legacy for her. And um, But I think the overall strategy that we've set will benefit her. And I think that's the point. Roshan had kids at the time we made that decision. Chris had kids. Steve's got kids. So the the five partners all sat around with that in mind. And I think there was a longer term plan for me to consider that too, which obviously has come to fruition now. So, yeah, the I mean, it's it's... A, building a better world in terms of the, the, the facts of that side of things. It's the climate change dilemma. It's increased greenhouse gas emissions. It's just having a better quality of life. And at the same time, it's the, I think it's, it's the thinking and the mindset and the critical thinking side of that that really comes out of that um, focus. It's, well, what can I do? What else can I do to improve the world? I can recycle. I can take on small projects. So I look at the, the goal we've set at a macro and a micro level. So at the macro level, we take on huge, these huge infrastructure projects that multi, multi-million, multi-billion dollar projects that will ultimately change the world. Coal will be replaced by um, biomass power or whatever, for example. Um, and then you've got the smaller projects that are, are going to do the same thing at a smaller level. But as long as we can build those blocks and, and make sure the overall gain is a net positive, then that's a great thing. And I, I think that's a good mindset to have in terms of anything you do. It's the it's the small incremental change, the positive, progressive manner in which you view things that um, that really drives us as as people and as a society. And that's that's the kind of message I'd I'd like for my daughter to inherit and run with, um, rather than kind of being happy where they are. And that continuous improvement mindset. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I love the idea of a continuous improvement mindset. You mentioned something earlier in the conversation and regarding a 50-year company and Nexus, and you mentioned macro and micro. So my last question to you is, you know, not 50 years from now, let's say 2025, where do you see Nexus? What kind of projects do you see, you, you know, the company engaging in? How are we, you know, perhaps participating on a macro and micro level? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we've we've already gone kind of from a, a small subset of a project life cycle, which is where we started the company, which was monitoring of engineering, procurement, construction, life cycle phase. We then took the company to early in that horizontal, um, early development, conceptual idea through financial investment decision, uh, final investment decision. And then on the other side of that, we've we've also built the back end where we're now an operational um, optimization and turnaround group. So we've kind of gone that full horizontal on on the project life cycle. Um, I think we'd like to take that a step further as Nexus and get involved pre-conceptual um, in, in terms of early development capital, taking the very highest level idea, running with it, uh, financing that idea, and, and just being a part of the early phases of projects and really influencing the direction those projects take from an early step. We, we kind of pick projects up at a point where the, the key stakeholders have made that decision. And I think we'd like to be that stakeholder that says, hey, we, we can influence X, Y, and Z with this project. Um, and that's that's really that that high level decision making we'd like. So I think we like to be on the development side of things, add some capital into the mix, and and really drive some projects forward early, uh, and and be early in that influence curve. Uh, on the other side of that that coin as well, I I think I'd like to develop 
this platform a little bit more, the bigger than us kind of charitable side. And that's more, I think that's just as much of a personal goal as it is a professional goal where we, we take this kind of nonprofit charitable organization and we expand that a little bit more as well. There's, there's, there's a hundred different programs in Dallas where we could do that just on our doorstep. So I think we can, we can build on that platform as well. So, um, continue to grow what we've already done as well. I think what we've done so far has been uh, exceptional. Um, we've, we've built in great teams. We're hiring great people. Um, we're, we're responsible for a lot of people's livelihoods and the, the responsibility that comes with that is, is, is a lot, but it's, it's challenging and it's, it's interesting. So um, I feel like continuing to do what we've already done um, as well as a, a couple of key add-ons to the to the front end back end to the business and I, th- I think we've we've got a pretty well-rounded organization there so that's kind of my my short-term vision i i went through the 50-year plan i think we could do that for a long time i mean infrastructure is a a, a hugely long-term uh, industry so i feel like we could just rinse and repeat for as long as we want to basically and um as long as the market supports us and we we keep doing a good job for our clients i, I have no doubt that we can get there Paul, thank you so much. And I look forward to working shoulder to shoulder with you, growing BTU and Nexus PMG. And thank you so much for your time today. Are there any last comments you'd like to share? No, I think we we covered most things. I appreciate your time, Raj. Thank you so much, Paul, and have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email, btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website, nexuspmg.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech, green tech sectors. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.